first we're going to hear from uh, Ted, our friend Ted Parker, who is a lecturer at the University of Toronto. And you just recently got your PhD from there, is that right? Yes, so congratulations on that. And he is going to talk to us about Demosthenes. The title of his paper is Medias's Slap, Aristocratic Affect in Democratic Oratory. So the handout is in the chat. Take it away, Ted. Thank you, Adrian, and thanks uh, to Adrian and Kiara for hosting the conference. I'm going to share the handout. After Ben's comments about the human face, I uh, don't want to see my own. So uh, my talk today is about the role of affect in Athenian forensic oratory. Of course, people have been talking about emotion in Greek oratory since Aristotle's tripartite division of logos, ethos, and pathos. More recently, however, the scholarly, the scholarly understanding of emotion in the Athenian court has become increasingly cognitivist, due in part to Aristotle's own belated influence. As a result, I think the field's dominant cognitivism could be beneficially balanced out by some of the insights of affect theory. In particular, I want to offer a reading of Demosthenes' speech against Medias, that does justice to the affective agenda of that speech and allows us to see how the cognitive approach could be complemented by a more affective one. But to set this up properly, we need to go back a little further to what the cognitivists are responding to, a position I'll call emotivism. This approach involves a negative judgment against Athenian forensic oratory for being overly emotional. The familiar appeals to pity and anger that we find in the Attic orators were felt to be inappropriate and emotionally manipulative. Inappropriate because this is a court of law convened to settle a question of fact. Why should the jury have to feel anything to make that judgment? Emotionally manipulative because on this model of the emotions, all the orator had to do was tell the jury to feel pity or anger, and just like that, they felt pity or anger. Thus, this view combines a naive view of the Athenian court. It's supposed to be about rational questions of fact, with a simplistic model of the emotions. The orator is just pulling levers to make the audience feel the desired emotions. Cognitivist scholars like Stephen Johnstone, Danielle Allen, and David Constan were thus quite right to challenge and supersede this view. Johnstone makes a particularly explicit critique, and it is, it is his account of the emotivist view that I've just summarized. According to Johnstone, appeals to pity should not be seen as, quote, emotional attempts to derail the operation of rational law, but are better understood in terms of their cognitive, though unspoken content. Johnstone's reasoning here is that we simply cannot understand emotion apart from its cognitive content. Quote, I am not saying that such appeals did not have an emotional aspect, that we can uh, only stand them, understand them only through their cognitive effects. Emotion as brute feeling would be meaningless, or at any rate, impossible for us to interpret and discuss. As a result, parsing an emotion for its implicit thought has greater explanatory value than treating it as an unanalyzable feeling. On this cognitive view, emotional appeals are only intelligible in terms of their rational contents. Similarly, Danielle Allen argues that speakers' frequent appeals to pity and anger were, quote, embedded in the language of ethical evaluation used in the Athenian courts. Each speaker couched his argument about dessert in terms of the claims he could make on the jury's pity or anger. Thus, when a speaker appeals to the jury's pity or anger, they are not so much trying to arouse those emotions in the hearts of the jurors as taking a claim about what they or their opponents deserve. Here, emotions may be read in terms of their propositional content. I ask for your pity means I do not deserve to be punished because of X, Y, and Z. Let's take an example from the speech we will be uh, examining more closely a little later against Medias. In passage one on your handout, Demosthenes states that if any of the jurors, quote, does not feel the kind of anger or gay against Medias as when a man deserves to die, he is mistaken. On the cognitivist account, Demosthenes is not really trying to, to get the jury to feel anger against Medias here, but is making an evaluative claim about Medias' actions. To deserve the demos' anger means to be a bad citizen according to certain objective criteria that Demosthenes will enumerate elsewhere in the speech. The language of emotion, then, is just argumentative shorthand and a container for propositional content. This is why being angry at someone is something the jurors can be right or thos or wrong about. Emotion on this account is not irrational at all 
but actually a complicated expression of facts and logic. One can see how the cognitivist approach would be a powerful tool in the analysis of forensic speeches. The emotional appeals of the orators, rather than embarrassing or uninterpretable, are actually continuous with the rest of their argumentation. Read for their propositional content, they unlock a deeper, even more intricate logical structure underlying these speeches. But what this approach leaves untapped is precisely the affective dimension of the emotions. What about the role of the emotions not as thought, but as affect? In treating the emotions as essentially rational, the cognitivist approach buys into the premise of the emotivist view that irrationality has no place in the courtroom. As a result, it cannot investigate what role affect might play in these speeches. And if we listen to a thinker like Nietzsche, then we have to consider the possibility that the role of irrational affect is not at all peripheral to the rhetoric of these speeches, but absolutely central to it. For Nietzsche, the cognitivists have it backwards. It is not that articulated pathos is rationally structured by an underlying logos, but that in the words of one Nietzschean scholar, quote, pathos is the ground and basis of any logos. On this irrationalist account, logos is just the screen for the needs, drives, affects, and feelings that underlie everything we say to each other. If this is so, then we are making a mistake and focusing only on the orator's outward rational argumentation. Rather, we also need to be sensitive to the affective undercurrent of the speech, which, if not more primary and basic than its argumentative shell, is at least of equal importance. For the remainder of this talk, I'd like to model what that change in perspective might look like through a reading of Against Medias. This speech is often read as a rational account, laboriously spelling out all the many reasons for Medias's incompatibility with the democratic collective. Through a close reading of the speech's climactic episode, Medias's public slap of Demosthenes, I argue that this rational account is complemented and complicated by the affective thrust of the speech. The feelings of shame, disgust, embarrassment, indignation, and hatred that Demosthenes communicates indirectly through his narration of the slap constitute part of the speech's message. In fact, this affective message actually cuts against the speech's overt argumentation, since these affects are more closely related to the aristocratic culture of feud than to the various reasons Demosthenes adduces for why Medias is democratically undesirable. By looking beyond and behind the orator's rational argumentation, we can access a dimension of the speech that is unarticulated but not unfelt and that can fundamentally change our interpretation of the speech. But before I get into this reading, I have to address one cognitivist concern at the outset, although maybe not among this group. Johnstone claimed that we can only understand the emotional appeals of the orators through their cognitive effects, that is, their propositional content. How then can we read for affect without reading for cognitive content? Won't anything we can, we can talk about necessarily be cognizable and therefore cognitive? On the one hand, there is a difference between what's speakable for us and what's speakable for Demosthenes. As we will see, due to the particulars of his rhetorical situation, there are things Demosthenes cannot say explicitly and that can only be articulated indirectly through affect. On the other hand, there are some affect theorists who, while not cognitivists, are more optimistic about the speakability of affect. Eugenie Brinkema, for instance, argues against the view, admittedly coming from a somewhat different quarter than the cognitivists, that, quote, affect is what resists systematicity and structure, that it is that thing I cannot name, what remains resistant, indefinable, what cannot be written, etc. Instead, she advocates a return to form through close reading, quote, the only way out for affect is via a way into its specificities. Following Brinkema's lead, I find not only close reading, but also narratology an effective way in to reading for affect. With that said, let's now take a closer look at Against Medias. In this, spe in this speech, Demosthenes prosecutes his political rival Medias for either punching or slapping him on the cheek at the Dionysia festival, where Demosthenes was serving at a chorus, as a chorus leader some two years earlier. Even from this short description, one can see the rhetorical challenges Demosthenes faced. According to Josiah Ober, these were four. The first is the timing. The slap occurred two years ago. Though Demosthenes secured a preliminary condemnation of Medias at the time through a probole procedure, he is only now taking the case to court, probably as a counter move in their larger feud. But why should the jury care about a slap from two years ago? This raises the second problem, 
which is the slightness of the offense. A slap, possibly a punch, but not a beating or an attempted murder. The lack of any physical injury may explain why this is a prosecution for hubris, insult, rather than IKEA, assault. The third problem is Demosthenes' immediate response to the slap, which is that he didn't respond. That is, Demosthenes did not hit back. This does not look particularly good in light of the fourth problem, which is the elite identity of both litigants, engaged as they were in an aristocratic feud before an audience of comparatively poor Athenians. As Ober puts it, quote, two years later, who really cared if one rich politician had bopped another in the nose? The incident could have been seen as a silly intra-elite spat and one that could have been solved quickly enough if, De if Demosthenes had just been man enough to hit back. The basic rhetorical problem of the speech, as over and from a somewhat different perspective, Peter Wilson conclude, hinges on the opposition between mass and elite, democratic and aristocratic. As Wilson points out, the original scene of the slap was markedly aristocratic. Demosthenes was a chorus leader, so one of the wealthiest citizens, and competing with other elites for civic honor. He was wronged in a rather aristocratic way, dishonored by a slap and his antagonist was a rival politician with whom he was engaged in an ongoing aristocratic feud. Demosthenes thus has to transmute a potentially alienating aristocratic scene into a democratic one the jury can get behind. Other scholars, including Ober, Wilson, and Victoria Wool, have well examined how Demosthenes performs this transmutation. As a chorus leader, Demosthenes was actually representative, nay embodiment of the demos, the slap was not an insult to his aristocratic honor, but a violation of his uh, democratic sanctity of his citizen body. His antagonist was an elite politician, but not a peer of Demosthenes, and there was no aristocratic feud between them. Rather, Demosthenes is a good elite who has the demos's back, and actually more of a middling citizen than an elite, while Medias is a filthy rich, power-hungry would-be tyrant whom the demos should fear and despise. As one might imagine, it takes quite a bit of argumentation to make this case. The payoff of all this argumentation is what Wool calls a metonymy, whereby an attack on uh, Demosthenes is an attack on the Deimos as a whole. In what follows, I call this the official democratic argument of the speech. But there is another rhetorical strategy in the speech that cuts against the official democratic argument. This countervailing strategy attempts to make effective use of the aristocratic elements of the speech as aristocratic i.e. not by translating them into democratic terms. This unofficial aristocratic strategy is necessary for two reasons. First, the jury may be unconvinced by Demosthenes' attempted metonymy. Is Medias really a threat to the democratic collective writ large? Is he really going to slap me, a random member of the demos, and not his elite rival? The second reason is more fundamental. What makes the case legible in the first place and compelling in the second is the passionate aristocratic scene that Demosthenes has tried to transmute into a more abstract democratic argument. If David Cohen is right about the role of feuding behavior in Athenian litigation, then the narrative structure of feud was something the jury not only would have been familiar with, but even may have expected from the litigants' speeches. In fact, Edward Harris suggests that Demosthenes may have invented at least one incident in the speech to make his conflict with Medias seem more longstanding. Uh, if this is so, then the affective drama of this aristocratic feud could be just as important as the speech's more democratic argumentation. In this unofficial aristocratic presentation of events, Demosthenes and Medias are engaged in a feud as rival elites, and Demosthenes is a good elite in the aristocratic sense. He upholds his own sense of honor in the face of a challenge from Medias. More on this later. Most strikingly, the jurors are treated as elites as well for they buy into the same elite values as the contestants and respect Demosthenes as an exemplar of those values. And part of being an exemplar of these aristocratic values is feeling the right feelings, as we'll see. Now, all this might sound a bit discursive and argumentative. Isn't this aristocratic argument just as cognitive and propositional as the democratic one? I would suggest instead that the aristocratic argument is not as explicitly articulated as the democratic one, and works mostly on the level of affect. Rather than an argument, it is more like a mood or an atmosphere. In fact, I would argue that the democratic argument actually cannot be presented as explicitly as the democratic one for two reasons. 
First, the official democratic argument of the speech has made the explicit assumption of an aristocratic identity problematic. The speech stokes up considerable anti-rich, anti-elite resentment in order to alienate medias as undemocratic. Ober even speaks of the class consciousness of the speech. Second, there is always the risk of putting the case in explicitly aristocratic terms, uh, the risk that that will exacerbate the rhetorical problem Demosthenes is trying to finesse, i.e. that he might look like the sore loser in a silly aristocratic squabble. On the other hand, the speech is not fully legible or compelling without the aristocratic elements, honor, feud, revenge, etc. Thus, I argue one, that these elements cannot be fully articulated in the speech, Two, that to the extent that they are communicated, it is on the level of affect rather than on the level of argumentation. And three, that the subtle communication of these aristocratic affects is no less vital to the success of the speech than its more explicit democratic argumentation. To observe this up close, let's examine Demosthenes' narration of Medius' slap, or rather his narration of a slap, since Demosthenes refuses to relate his particular slap itself a telling sign of his humiliation in an affectively significant move. Demosthenes' non-narration comes in the context of an argument that he is not exaggerating how terrible, de nos, and terrifying, boberos, such things are. Uh, and that's passage two on your sheet. The jury may suspect, the jury may suspect, um, since Demosthenes did not hit back, that the incident is really not that serious. This is actually the context for passage one examined earlier. If any of you have been of Athens, does not feel the kind of anger against Medias, as when a man deserves to die, he is mistaken. To counter this impression, Demosthenes tells the story of two Athenians, Othunus and Eoion, who both found themselves in Demosthenes' position, but unlike Demosthenes, did hit back and actually killed their insulters. On an argumentative level, this is supposed to show the wisdom of Demosthenes' forbearance. On an affective one, it's an opportunity to put the jury in Demosthenes' shoes and let them feel what he felt and presumably still feels. Speaking of Eoion, Demosthenes continues in passage three, it was not the blow that aroused his anger, but the humiliation. Being beaten is not what is terrible for free men, although it is terrible, but being beaten with the intent to insult. A man who strikes may do many things, men of Athens, but the victim may not be able to describe to someone else even one of these things, the way he stands, the way he looks, his tone of voice, when he strikes to insult, when he acts like an enemy, when he punches, when he strikes them in the face. When men are not used to being insulted, this is what stirs them up. This is what drives them to distraction. No one, men of Athens, could by reporting these actions convey to his audience terrible effects of outrage in the exact way that it really and truly appears to the victim and those who witness it. In this passage, Demosthenes makes a fine distinction between the physical pain caused by a blow and the social suffering it inflicts. To be struck, ephubre, causes atemia, humiliation, dishonor, and this is what arouses anger or gay in the man who is struck. Incidentally, this is why a mere slap is such a serious matter. It's not the physical pain, it's the social suffering. That this is not spelled out is perhaps another sign of Demosthenes' embarrassment at the slightness of the slap and another effectively significant omission. Additionally, we should note the ambiguity of atemia in this passage. As Wilson and Ober observe, there are really two notions of time present in the speech. The aristocratic honor competed over in his zero sum game and the democratic dignity accorded to all citizens. As the speech goes on, we should pay attention to which sense of time predominates. The passage then transitions into a vivid description of the embodied experiment, experience of what it's like to be struck f hubre. Paradoxically though, this vivid description is actually a generic and colorless one. It is not Demosthenes' specific experience, or is it? And though it contains the word enargeis, the enargeia in question is in the negative. Demosthenes says the sufferer cannot communicate how it really was to someone who wasn't there. On the other hand, as Wall and Demos Aspatharas note, this rhetorical ploy allows the jury to imagine themselves in the position of someone being struck, and all of that experience is unspeakable profundity. On the other hand, as Dean McDowell notes, 
The generality of the passage does not prevent one from identifying its perspective specifically with that of Demosthenes. I know I have made the mistake more than once of scanning over the passage and thinking, ah, yes, this is where he tells the story of getting slapped in the face. It's not, and technically Demosthenes never does tell the story apart from the generic scene of this passage. But the implicit focalization through Demosthenes' perspective here is important since it forms the basis for an identification between him and the jury. And what the jury identifies with specifically is Demosthenes' intense rage. Indeed, not only is the rage intense, but fundamentally embodied and therefore incommunicable to someone who wasn't there. It's not an emotion one could perfectly cognize into propositions that could then be organized into an abstract argument. One could try. In Aristotle's formulation, anger is a desire accompanied by pain for a perceived revenge on account of a perceived slight on the part of people who are not fit to slight one or one's own. So if Demosthenes is angry with Medias, it means Medias slighted him but was not fit to do so for various democratic reasons that Demosthenes will go into. Demosthenes is himself engaged in something like this translation from emotion to cognition in the beginning of the passage when he relates anger to the ideas of Time and hubris. But Demosthenes recognizes that something is lost in translation and that loss is what he ends up being most concerned with. The feeling can't be recovered or communicated, he says, but the fact that he wrings his hands over this loss is itself an effectively significant gesture. If the passage begins with Demosthenes saying, the jury would be wrong, uk orthos, not to feel this anger, it ends with him denying the possibility of their ever being able to really feel it. But they don't have to really feel it. They just have to feel that he feels it. Paradoxically, lamenting that he cannot communicate his anger to them actually does help communicate his anger to them, though not exactly propositionally. And the real kicker is that it's technically not his anger, but one's anger, since Demosthenes is too embarrassed and humiliated to relate the story of his own slapping. This was his explanation of why Oion was so mad. Yet despite Demosthenes not explicitly saying, I am humiliated, I am furious, these affects come across through his argumentation. Demosthenes continues with an extended comparison between himself and Oion. Wilson notes the aristocratic resonances of Oion's story, on the one hand, an elite politician, on the other, a guest at a dinner party, the symposium being an aristocratic institution. The point of Demosthenes' comparison is to show that even though he didn't strike back, he was actually even angrier than Oion, and this is passage four on your sheet. Consider by Zeus and the gods, men of Athens, think and calculate in your own mind how much more angry I was likely to have felt when Medias did things like this than Oion did then, the man who killed Boiotus. Demosthenes goes on to enumerate all the reasons he had to be ang angrier than Oion. Here, we are back to anger being an emotion one can be right or wrong about, one that has reasons that can be considered, skepsaste, and calculated, logisaste, e.g., Oion was struck by a drunk acquaintance, whereas I was struck by a sober enemy, therefore I had better grounds on which to be angry. The reasons, however, are less important than Demosthenes' overall conclusion, which is that he was so angry that it's a miracle he didn't strike back. Passage 5. Because of good sense, or rather good fortune, I think, men of Athens, I decided to hold back and not get carried away to do any irre irreparable damage. But I have much sympathy for Oion, and all men, if someone has, the has been the victim of outrage and has come to his own rescue. In this passage, Demosthenes vacillates between attributing his forbearance to rational good sense and irrational good fortune. But also present is the possibility of being carried away, ex acventa, into doing something irrational and involuntary. I say involuntary because Demosthenes goes on to pardon, that is, to have sunome for, Oion for his violent response to dishonor. As David Constant has shown, sugnome, pardon, is for involuntary offenses, so Oion's violent response is here imagined as an involuntary one, a visceral, irrational reflex. Oion couldn't help it, and that's why he deserves pardon. By granting much sugnome to Oion, Demosthenes acknowledges that that murderous reaction was a possibility for him as well, 
This is why he has to correct himself with because of good sense or rather because of good fortune. This actually leaves us with a bit of a paradox. Demosthenes deliberated fortuitously, autuhos babuleustai, or reasoned irrationally, coming to the correct conclusion by random chance. Demosthenes represents his actions in this way to present what he felt in a rational rage that could have carried him away into an involuntary response of extreme violence, like Eoion, as just as important as his reasoning. Indeed, his reasoning did not actually determine his actions. Tuke did. In the next section, Demosthenes engages in special pleading for Eoion. He was convicted by a single vote, and that without his having begged the jurors. From this, Demosthenes draws the following conclusion, passage six. On the one hand, the judges who decided against him voted to convict not because he struck back, but because he struck back in such a way that he actually killed him. On the other, those who voted to acquit allowed an extreme amount of retaliation to a man who was the victim of physical indignity. Why this special pleading for Oion? Demosthenes could have said, Oion lost, the jury convicted him for retaliating. This precedent supports my own decision not to retaliate. Instead, Demosthenes goes out of his way to justify Oion's actions, which are seemingly incompatible with his own. He does this, I suggest, for affective reasons. Demosthenes is not aligning himself with Oion's hyperbolic response, but with the hyperbolic feelings that underlie that response. These feelings have an aristocratic flavor, both because of the particulars of Oion's story and because of the aristocratic sense of Time that has emerged in this section. Compare Atimas Dominos, used of Oion in passage five. The upshot of all this seems to be that Demosthenes' democratic response is only acceptable if paired with Oion's aristocratic feelings. Demosthenes wraps up this part of his speech by relating the events of that day to the present trial and to the setting of a future precedent, passage seven. What follows then? I have acted so cautiously to prevent any irreparable damage from being done, but I did not even strike back. From whom should I receive revenge <coughs> for the wrongs I have suffered? From you and the laws, I think. This case indeed should serve as an example that one should not strike back in the heat of anger at all men who commit outrage and are abusive, but bring them here before you because you are the men who maintain and preserve the protections for victims provided by the laws. Here, Demosthenes defends his own actions and returns to the official democratic argument of the speech. Even though Demosthenes did not uh, exactly hold himself back for reasons, but rather fortuitously, his example will allow future victims to do so with the knowledge the laws and the jurors will defend them. But though Demosthenes will have helped to establish this brave new world, his own feelings belong to the old one. He approves of those future victims who will seek legal justice, but he identifies more with the affect of Eoion. To conclude, I have been arguing that the implicit affective thrust of against Medias is just as important as the speech's explicit argumentation. In particular, I have suggested that this affective thrust is markedly aristocratic, centering on feelings of humiliation and rage related to themes of honor, feud, and revenge. And that this affective agenda contrasts with the more democratic rhetoric the speech is usually known for. An important part of my argument is that these feelings emerge narratively and by implication, rather than through explicit argumentation. Relatedly, the significance of these affects cannot be reduced to their propositional contents. The point of this mood or atmosphere of anger, sustained throughout the speech as the citations under passage one show, is not to encode cognitive propositions along the lines of, Medias is an undesirable citizen for X, Y, and Z reasons. In fact, the affect is not about Medias so much as Demosthenes. The rhetorical importance of this anger is that he feels it and that that makes him a more compelling antagonist in their aristocratic feud than he might otherwise have been. Equally, I am not making the emotivist argument that Demosthenes is trying to make the jury angry. His point is to communicate his own anger not necessarily to stir up a similar anger among the jurors, though he might also be doing that, and he certainly says that he's trying to. Rather, Demosthenes' self-presentation as furious and baying for Medias' blood 
see the additional citations under passage one, is itself an important message of the speech. As Nija suggests then, the explicit argumentation of this speech should be read in conjunction with its affective undercurrent since the latter has as much to tell us as the former.